Good morning. Welcome to our Bob Connect Forum on defining your organization's public relations and media policy. Jointly brought to you by Center for Nonprofit Leadership, CMPL, and the Institute of Public Relations of Singapore, IPRS. I'm Jensen Long from the CMPL, part of the National Volunteer and Philanthropy Center. Singapore is one of the most technological developed countries, not only in Southeast Asia, but in the rest of the world. Media, most notably social media, has become a companion for almost everyone. Based on statistics from Data Reporters website, there were 4.96 million social media users in Singapore in January 2021. As charities develop and institute various policies to guide and provide the framework for better governance, we have thus invited speakers from IPRS to share the importance of a well-defined public relations and media policy. Today's forum is intended to help charities understand how to construct a well-defined media and public relations policy, how a well-defined media and public relations policy can help build the charity brand and strengthen positive community relations, how to, how to establish strategic communication policies and develop an effective crisis communication management plan. Before we continue further, I would like to request your attention to some administrative matters. All attendees' cameras and microphones will be switched off during the forum. Please use the Q&A chat function to comment or post your questions. There will be a video and audio recording of this forum and the presentation deck will be shared to all participants after the forum. Thank you very much. I shall now invite Ms. Ko Jungwe, President of IPRS, to start off today's forum. Over to you, please, Jack. Thank you, Jensen. Um, on behalf of the Institute of Public Relations Singapore, good morning, everyone. And thank you to CMPL, Kitson, and team for inviting us to this morning's Bot Connect series. First of all, um, please allow me to commend all of you for being in one of the most challenging and demanding sector, the nonprofit sector. Having said that, it is also one of the most inspiring and rewarding sector to be in, be it full-time or as a volunteer. Um, I recall a time, the time when I was the director of uh, public relations and fundraising for the Salvation Army. Um, it was uh, challenging, but it was certainly very fulfilling. Uh, one story I perhaps I could share is um, a major donor called and said that he was unhappy with us and I had to go down and see him. Uh, but that turned out to be one of the most um, rewarding uh, aspect of my work and that is to meet donors, whatever they have to say to us, whether it is a complaint or a compliment, any interaction is an interaction uh, for, to build relationships and to restore relationships as well. Um, so having said that, um, you guys are in a great place. Uh, it is a privilege, therefore, for the speakers, Kathy, Annie, Jackie, uh, Candice, myself, to be here to share with you some of our thoughts on managing communications and the media and address the questions that you have for the panel this morning. As the champion for the PR profession, the mission of the IPRS is to advance the practice and uphold standards through training, education, and exchange of ideas. The IPRS marked our 50th anniversary last year in 2020, uh, a most amazing year really, where the world was galvanized to fight a pandemic that took everyone by surprise. Meeting the challenge head on, people, governments, nonprofits, and corporations work together to save lives and jobs while resetting our operations with the adoption of new solutions and systems. And these new approaches continue to evolve for greater efficiencies and outcome. Continuous learning and skills upgrading are important. And as leaders managing our own businesses or serving on nonprofit boards like yourself, we need to arm ourselves with a certain level of understanding of the communications process and our media landscape today. Increasingly, one of the key roles of senior management is to harness the power of communications 
and manage communications risk. Oversee information flowing in and out of organizations and to work with executive teams and understand how they create and disseminate content. One of the most critical content today is the impact of ESG, the environment, social and governance on the work that we do. The IPRS launched a survey recently on ESG to find out how leaders and communicators are embracing ESG communications in their purpose and programming. The results of the survey is available on IPRS website. Everything has a communications outcome and impact. No individual or organizations are spared these consequences. Knowledge and strategic communication skills are our best defense against the often runaway train of news and over information. So with that, it is now my pleasure to hand over the time to my fellow communicators. And I would like to introduce the moderator for the day, our IPRS member, Candice. Candice is an independent consultant with over 25 years of communications experience. Her most recent role was as a managing director of Buster Mastella in Shanghai. She has also worked as a regional communications lead at companies such as Honeywell and IBM. So over to you, Candice and my teammates. Thank you, Chuak Mei. And good morning, everybody. I would like to start by inviting our speakers to do a quick self-introduction. And I'm going to do it alphabetical order. So first up, can we have Katie O'Brien, Managing Director of Red Shoe Communications. Good morning, everyone. I'm a communications coach, managing director of a company called Red Shoe Communications. I've been in Singapore for 25 years, and I'm an accredited IPRS member. Very happy to be here. Thank you, Kerry. Next, can we have Ms. Uh, Aniru Sharma, Director, Communications and Strategic Relations, Duke NUS Medical School. Thanks, Candice. Uh, yeah, as, like uh, Candy said, I'm Director of Communications and Strategic Relations at Duke NUS, uh, the Singapore's only graduate medical school. Um, and uh, I've been in communication for, well, I don't even want to count the number of years, but initially I started as a journalist. And since 2002, I've been doing corporate communication, crisis communication for different sectors. Thank you, Candy. Thank you, Ani. Finally, we have Jackie Yu, who is Deputy Director, Head of Communications, Singapore Pools Private Limited. Morning, Candice. Morning, Candice. Morning, everyone. Um, Jackie from uh, Singapore Pools. So I head a communications team here at Singapore Pools. Um, Join them for about a year now. Um, but I've been in the in-house corporate comms industry for the past 20 years or so in diverse companies ranging from defense and aerospace to technology, built environment, and so on and so forth. Happy to be here to discuss some um, policies and issues here. Thank you, Jackie. We have a very cool experienced team here today. Uh, first up, we will also like to welcome all the participants to feel free to connect with the speakers, myself, as well as Drug May via LinkedIn after today's session, if you would like to know more about us. Okay, to kickstart the panel discussion, uh, I will be addressing some questions that were actually submitted in advance from some of you. And of course, you know, please feel free to post additional questions on the Q&A chat, and we will try to address as many of them as possible today. All right, so for the questions that we've received in advance, uh, one of the key questions revolved around media and public relations policy. And I would like to first address that to Jackie. Uh, Jackie, what do you consider as the key define media and public relations policy? Okay, Candice, uh, maybe before I jump into that, let me start with answering uh, the more basic question of what is a media policy, All right? So simply put, um, the media policy is your organization's rules of engagement with the media. It means that the policy should have a spell out a code of conduct, SOPs to guide all your interactions with the media. And then if you extend that to public relations policy, the policy would then cover all the rules of engagement with all your other key shareholders as well. And that would include your uh, donors, your employees, your board, et cetera, et cetera. Right? But then we move on to the next and more important question of why do you need a media policy? Right? So um, the short answer to that is that uh, having a well-defined, clear media policy in place would help to protect your organization's reputation and branding. 
when the crunch, uh, when it comes to the crunch. And because you want to ensure that the information that you put out uh, is always accurate, is always consistent, and uh, uh, reflects what your organization stands for. Okay. And with that as a background, then uh, it's kind of clear what, what kind of elements then go into a media or public relations policy. Right? And I would start with um, five key points and Ani and Katie can jump in to add on more. Um, firstly, the policy should set the tone of interactions. So you want to talk about um, always being professional when you get media queries, when you talk to the media uh, representatives, for example. Um, you could even go down to talk about um, set a time frame to guide when you need to reply to the media within the hour, within two hours, and so on and so forth. Right. That's one. Uh, secondly, we want to define who your official spokespersons are. And I say spokespersons because you need more than one as a backup, for example, or even to address different issues when the time comes. Right? Um, and this spokesperson should be the person fronting interviews, should be the person quoted in uh, media replies, for example, um, in whatever interactions you have with the media. And the third point I would like to talk about is um, the policies should also cover what a non-spokesperson should do when they are approached by the media. So anyone who receives a call from the media, for example, what to say, what not to say, um, guide the person to take down contact details uh, so that someone can get back to them within the hour, right? Um, and then fourthly, list down the approval process so that everyone is clear who's the one drafting the replies, who's the one um, clearing the replies before it goes out to the public and uh, so on and so forth. So there's a clear process in place that everyone can follow. And, and the last point I think uh, is also important, but sometimes missed, is a follow-up. So after the reply goes out, after the article comes out, who does a follow-up to ensure that what the report says accurately reflects what uh, uh, you wanted to say in the first place. So five points, uh, the tone, the spokespersons, the, uh, what a non-spokesperson should do, approval process, as well as the follow-up. Thank you, Jackie. A very, very clear explanation of what a media policy should have. Uh, on the same point, would you think a blanket PR or media policy be sufficient? I don't know if Ani or Kerry wants to weigh in on that. Sure, I can talk about it. Um, actually, whatever Jackie said are really valid points. And I, before I address blanket uh, PR policy, I wanted to add that in my experience, sometimes it helps when you compile your processes and then share it with the rest of the organization so that they can use it as a reference whenever they need to. And one point he made, and I think I can't repeat it again, is that you need to inform all your staff or colleagues what not to do. Because sometimes they are actually acting in good faith and responding to a criticism online, but actually they are doing more harm than not. So you have to remind them they are not official spokesperson and what they can do. So that, that's like really good. Uh, but for whether media policy can, on its own can do something, I don't think so. And I'm sure uh, uh, Jackie and Kathy will agree as well because uh, branding is like that. You know, you have to have everything in place before it starts to work. Media policy is one, media and PR policy is one major component of that. But on the other hand, and I was going to talk about it uh, later as well, how do you become purposeful and how do you embody that in everything that you do? That is how uh, it will help you establish your brand as a very purposeful brand. Thank you, Ani. I think since we've, we've talked about spokesperson, maybe Kerry can, can, you know, can vary, vary in on, you know, particularly for a non-profit, you know, who do you think should be the spokesperson for the non-profit? Because I think that would be a question that a lot of participants would be very interested in. Yes, and, we, and we've had some questions on that, Candice, haven't yep. we? Yeah. I guess to, uh, to everyone, to think about two things. You have organizational spokespeople, and you also have campaign or issue spokespeople. And you can look at those separately. Let me take the campaign or issue ones first, because that you can ring fence. You can allow the person leading a project or a campaign to be the spokesperson particularly and only for that. You need to be very clear, make sure that they're well briefed on that, and then give them instructions. As, as Ani was saying a moment ago, knowing how to decline is important. 
So if you have an individual running a campaign who then gets a question on some other matter to do with the organization, you simply need to give them a couple of phrases to always use. That's not my area, or I'll check with our leadership whether there's someone to give a comment on that. Don't promise that the leadership will give a comment because even that may be beyond their awareness of what's going on at the organizational level. But a simple, polite response and then following through in the organization should do it. So campaign spokespeople are well worth thinking about and often we appreciate them more because they're the ones who are at the front lines who are dealing with your constituents. At the organizational level, up to three individuals. Those indivi and the reason for limiting the number, by the way, is because it's truly difficult for your senior leaders to all agree on a set of messages and commit them to memory. So realistically, even though you may have multiple heads of areas, you need to choose the top three who will spend that extra amount of time together agreeing key messages, not only with each other, but with the board as well. You may not be able to afford training or coaching for them as spokespeople, but that's fine as long as you have consistency. And uh, my suggestion would be on that consistency on those messages you agree, keep your statements to seven words or less. Seven words or less are proven by research to be the easiest for listeners to process, and they're the most quotable. Better to have a few small phrases repeated over and over again for consistency than to have people going off script because they'd like to expand. That's definitely very, very good advice. Okay, maybe we can move on to the next topic, which is how charities can enhance their brand and strengthen their image. And I think this is a topic that everybody will be interested in and perhaps all three speakers can weigh in with some of your advice on how charities can promote their image. Uh, shall we start with Ani this time? Sure. <laughs> uh, well, this is my favorite topic anyway. And I have helped build brands in tourism, in telecommunication, higher education, and the government sector, so I, I can tell you that I have seen the different phases of that. And since I have been in both private and uh, government sector, I can, and I work very briefly for uh, non-profit as well, uh, I can tell you that the difference between how uh, marketing professionals and non-profit think of branding is uh, more as a total brand experience for products and you know, consumer-oriented things, and for non-profits, it's more like what is the identity, what and why, they are, you know, they want to uh, convey the message. Uh, so for me, that brand uh, building is a very um, simple task, but it's also the most complex uh, if you do it wrong. So you have to start by building what your purpose is. Once you know what your purpose is, that, you know, half the job is done. And then it becomes more like, how do you embody and embrace that purpose in everything that you do? And both uh, Jackie and uh, Kathy said things about consistency that applies here absolutely because you may have a purpose, you may also embody, but if you're not consistent, well, you're not building one brand, you're building multiple brands and that's beyond the scope of uh, your one brand. Uh, and to add to the consistency bit, I would say what helps is to be authentic. Sometimes you see other brands are doing multiple things very exciting, very you know, nice and uh, superlative rhythm. Don't, don't be fooled by that, it doesn't matter. Your brand is your brand. And even if it is basic, simple, that is what you be proud of, you be authentic about and be consistent about. And I know, I hope, please don't misunderstand me. Uh, I often feel that art and creativity, this is considered like you know, a side thing by some people. And I don't believe that because I don't think that uh, art related organizations can be sidelined like that. Why? Because art and culture is so important for the building of societies and communities. Uh, I mean, why do we have a Ministry of Communication and Art and you know, our, why there are so many things happening there? Because we all know the importance of art and culture. And beca because of that, I say that don't ever feel like you're an underdog, you're not. You are actually the spine of the community that holds it together and use it to your advantage. And I would come to that uh, in a bit about how you can use that uh, advantage to create content. Uh, but before that, you, you, uh, once you have built the brand, you have defined your purpose and you know how to be authentic, please remember that it's not only a communication manager's job, 
It is everybody's job. So unless you do that engagement internally in the organization, don't even talk about external uh, messaging. If you're not passionate great, about this, <laughs> because, you know, I mean, like it's very cliched phrase, but charity begins at home. So if your brand, brand is not understood within the organization, you won't be able to uh, articulate it outside. So that, that's very important. And lastly, I mean, once you have the buy-in internally, then you have to see what your connection with the community is and use the uh, low-hanging fruit of the neighbors, of your staff's families and friends and the neighborhoods, first to establish yourself and then go beyond that. Because with each step, you're expanding rather than you go for the bigger thing and then come closer to home. I mean, so these are the basic things that I thought uh, I could share that these help. There are a few other things and hopefully I can talk a little bit more later on about what your content strategy could be. Thank you, Ani. So you've highlighted consistency, authenticity, you know, making sure internal audiences are aligned before going external. That's great advice. Uh, moving on, Jackie, do you have anything, any advice on this topic that you'd like to share with the participants? I think the points brought up by Ani are very, uh, very clear. Definitely be authentic. Mm -hmm. Don't try to be someone that you're not. So, but then if you have a lot of different spokesperson and also um, if every employee has their own social media accounts, how do you yeah. ensure consistency, which is another point that Ani brought up, right? So I would think mm -hmm. that uh, for one, um, in terms of uh, building your brand, you probably want to start with listing down what your brand traits are, right? So everybody is clear and agree uh, whether you want to be a, 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 have a lighthearted personality, for example, where you project yourself. Uh, that's one. Um, so you build a consistent image so that you don't have a pose that is a bit jokey and another pose that's a bit um, serious and that's a bit of a jarring and it doesn't help you to build that brand image over time. So that's your personality that you want to also uh, be very clear about so that you build a consistent uh, brand image on that. And then the other thing that Ani brought up about being clear about your purpose, I think that's the most important thing to start with. Um, but also, uh, to drill it down further, you also want to define a bit um, clearer what your purpose is so that it's not too generic. Um, you don't want to just talk about, I support the arts, for example. You want to be a bit more clearer so that your supporter has a, can build a mental image of what exactly they are supporting. And from there, they build an emotional bond. So when you talk about your brand, you should also consider the emotional part of your supporters and how do you form that strong bond with them that they will always love you, right? Thank you, Jackie. Great. I think both Ani and Jackie also touched on um, arts-based charity, which is a question that came in advance as well. But you see, the question was, how do you encourage support towards a charity that is arts-based, could be arts, heritage, cultural groups, and often deemed to be less urgent or even frivolous? Uh, anybody wants to take that question? I'll take a piece Jackie. of it. Oh, oh, Kelly, yes, Kelly, yeah. Yeah, right. I'll take one part because this also builds on what my friends on the panel have been saying all along. Uh, right. Pause to think for a moment about what one of your employees would say in a social setting, just among friends, if asked, oh, who do you work for? What's it like? Really simple, casual conversations. As one of my clients calls it, she says she has her barbecue cards meaning that she has thought through what are the answers to social questions if she was somewhere so casual as a barbecue. She really likes to picture herself in her shorts, in her slippers, in her most casual setting. And if someone said, oh, who do you work for? Would she be able to stay contextual and yet represent the organization well? Help your employees with that because they don't know that themselves. So take that language and break it down to very simple phrases. Uh, we went through a period uh, in the last 20 years of too much corporate language about vision and mission, et cetera, which no employee ever uses in conversation. Give them short, simple phrases and then find ways to reinforce them in the organization that you give them to them as screensavers or that you have posters around the organization if they come in physically. Make sure the receptionist has this same language. The receptionist might be the first person that, that people are meeting and that person represents your brand. So make it simple and make it very accessible. So that, back to the arts as you asked Candice, um, they do make people who they meet day to day love the arts the way they love the arts. 
uh, see the vision of the organization simply through this person's enthusiasm about his or her job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, if Excellent. I can add there, Candice, uh, like Kathy said, yep. um, you know, many people join not-for-profit because they're passionate about certain things. So, I mean, it becomes the leader's job to enlighten and flame that passion even more. And, uh, you know, in one organization where I work, I, uh, my, I was building, helping them build the brand. And what I did first was an audit talking from the receptionist to the dean uh, or the president or whoever there is in the organization and talk to them and see what they feel. And you will be surprised at how the responses reflect differently. And it's not very corporate sometimes. Yes, the top leadership will know exactly what they should say, but maybe middle way somewhere people uh, slip and they say something which they understood as correct, but it is not. So that's very important. And that's what I meant when I was talking about internal buy-in. You have to create a framework where you align what your values are, what your vision and mission are, and then what are the attributes that you want to be known for? Because all these things could be different and still alike. And that kind of a content framework is uh, can be a very good part of the content strategy to reflect, like uh, uh, Jackie said, consistency in your day-to-day messaging or your posters or whatever do you do you do talk. Thank um, you. Jackie? If, if I may add on, um, I'll, I'll take a bit of a contrarian view and push the discussion further. So I think when it comes to the arts, right, um, perhaps we should accept the fact that it is a fair perception that there will be a large swath of public who may not think of um, arts when they think of charities. Okay. If uh, we can start with that acceptance, um, fair enough, right? I mean, even for us, some jobs and some companies are not deemed essential. <laughs> all right. So I think, um, so I think yeah. not all charities are equal in that sense. Um, some may see you as less needy or less urgent, and we can't change that. So if we can accept the fact that we'll never be able to convince a certain segment of the public to, to donate to us or to support us, then perhaps we can focus our energy on that segment that we know uh, support us no matter what. And then we try to understand what they are looking for and build that bond with them. Like we were talking about earlier about building that brand loyalty. It's the same. So you identify your target audience. It could be a small segment, but it could be a very, very loyal following if you manage to connect with them uh, emotionally and rally them to your cause, right? Um, So in terms of how to actually do that, I think, uh, uh, another suggestion is also to see whether we can find a topical theme to align with uh, what we are doing so that we can build the story around uh, our cause. For example, in recent months when we talk about uh, mental health issues, which is a, a, a kind of a trending topic, right? Perhaps you could also frame our narrative towards how art therapy, for example, could be a platform for for us to release some of these mental issues, uh, mental stress issues. And that would help us to have a platform for us to uh, tell our story about what we do, for example. Um, And I think the other part about building a strong brand with a a, a small lawyer following, uh, one of the examples that I am actually quite, um, uh, one of the courses that I follow is Voices for Animals. Not sure if you are aware of that. It's different from arts, but I think the point I'm trying to make is that they build a very strong personality. They are very firm in their cause. They know exactly what they, are, what they stand for. And from there, they build a, a, a movement of people who are very, very loyal followers. It could be not a big segment of the public, but they become um, very emotionally attached to your cause and they rally on your behalf. And that's how the movement spreads and grows. So similarly, I, I suppose the principle could also apply to whatever uh, segment of the, organ, uh, of the charity sector you're in. Thank you, thank you for the speakers. Very interesting perspective on actually um, doing a, a niche customer segmentation that delivers results versus you know spreading it too wide. Yeah. Can and on the same topic, sorry, yes, Kenny. Yes. I wonder if I could give a shout to out jump in. A great strategy. So something that was pursued last year that's a wonderful example of what Jackie was saying about the arts. I'm sure many of you remember the video called The Pitch. It was created by the three big media companies in town, Pangdemonium, uh, Wild Rice, and Singapore Repertory Company. And the directors of all three created this magnificent video 
that was quite self-mucking of how painful they found the circuit breaker and the shutdown on the arts, calling each other, um, uh, you know, um, uh, kvetching over what was happening to them. But they made this video um, as a little dramatization of what they were going through and of how they then contacted each other to say, hey, maybe we need to work together on this one. Stop being competitors and, and instead become collaborators. It was such an entertaining video. They did such a wonderful job. So on many levels, it was connecting with the public that may not have necessarily been a follower of, of any one of the three of them. They were uh, putting themselves back in the creative process during a time when their ability to do so was extremely limited. And at the very end, they did make a pitch for donations as well. I would not have thought to donate to the arts at that time a year ago, had it not been for the fact that friends said, this is such a cool video, you have to see it. And at the end of it, they had my money. It was just a wonderful engagement. Yeah, sorry, can you say, I just saw a message that, you know, not the only art charity is here. So I just wanted to say that actually, um, most of these things also apply to other sectors, but in specifically, um, I have worked with uh, like a, a digital uh, um, accessibility NGO in the Middle East, and they work a lot with the disabled people. And these, these disabilities are like actually beyond any of us can imagine. And I've seen how they've used technology to let them uh, do work, day-to-day -day work, which they were not able to uh, manage without the technology and use that as an example to spur other people to come forward, not only to accept technology as part of their day-to-day uh, -day life, but also donors who could come forward and say, okay, there's somebody making an impact in this disability area through technology, so I need to invest a little bit of money and help the communities. Uh, one thing that really helps in any sector is that you create a touch point journey of your customer uh, and the audience. So you can try it do two ways. One is you see the beneficiary and see what is their touch point journey around your organization, how your value chain works, or uh, look at it from, from a donor's perspective and then do a touch point journey from their perspective, how it can align with your work. And finally, you can do internally, uh, pick one of your audience who is the most uh, connected with these two donor and the beneficiary and see how what their touch point journey looks like. And if there are some areas of alignment, that could be a very good uh, point of confluence where you can see what, what, what are the things that you can do in a different way so these be overlap and connect. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, it's always helpful to do um, customer journey mapping for your different personas. Yeah. And again, like you said, you know, if there's intersection, then, you know, you could, you know, reach different personas within the same touch points as well. So definitely very useful. On, on the topic of tools, there's, there was also a question on what cost-effective tools do you think are available to nonprofits to monitor the bus out there, both positive and negative? I could uh, start by adding that um, there are actually, you know, we often forget that all the social media platforms, they have inbuilt analytics uh, that can be used to monitor what you're doing and whether it's working. Uh, and of course, there are a lot of very good paid tools like Hootsuite and you know, uh, uh, Social Buzz and et cetera, which can be used if you have some money. And some actually don't require that much, say like $19 a month. So that could be a good investment to uh, invest in those. But if you want to do something completely free, what you could do is, and Jackie uh, and I were discussing that previously as, as well, you could use things like Google Alerts to set up multiple alerts for you. Some could be for positive news and some could be specifically for negative buzz that's going around. So you keep an eye on both sectors. And uh, in my experience, I still do. Uh, we have paid tools, but I still rely on my Google alerts to see the first 10 knowledge because it generates as it happens. And that way I can alert my team whenever I need to. I can alert my leadership whenever there is something. And then that makes you a very valuable component of the organization increases your credibility. Plus you do the job what you're meant to do for monitoring. You know whether your messaging is working or not. Uh, you know, so and anybody else wanna add? Jackie, you wanna add something? 
Uh, I think other than that, um, it also helps to know whether there are certain key issues or key times that you are worried about. And other than Google Alerts, you could also then monitor um, uh, the chattiest platforms in Singapore, uh, Hardware Zone, for example, if you're expecting a lot of uh, negative discussion. Uh, must share news, they have a, a lot of comments, a lot of interactive comments as well. So some of these more um, active social media platforms where you know a lot of discussions take place, you might just want to take a more frequent look during your times of um, needs or, or crisis or issues, for example. Thank you. Actually, on the same note, you know, how would you, I mean, what's your advice when there are negative comments? You know, I mean, this was a question that was submitted in advance as well, you know, where content could be negatively interpreted uh, by readers. What actions can charities take to address negative um, comments? I don't know, Kelly, would you like to take that? I'll start, but I know my friends have plenty of experience in this. So first and foremost, it's something Jackie said earlier, and it's so important to start with this. Not every negative comment is a crisis. <laughs> so if you're in the give and take of, of, uh, the, world, of the public forum, you have to accept that there will be all sorts of comments coming to you, whether it's on official media, social media, word of mouth. Having said that, you do want to keep an eye and see what is being said, and you want to catch any issues that could affect the organization's reputation. Your reputation is a very important piece of the entire uh, pursuit of the organization's goals. So should you find yourselves with a situation, a few thoughts you might uh, use in, in uh, principles you might keep in mind would be three different groups that, or three different uh, categories it may affect, in order, people, planet, property. They all matter, but people is always first. So if the uh, perceived emergency, if you will, has an effect on people, it's extremely high. You need to look at that. The people been negatively affected. Is it possible that the organization has played a part? That's pretty high. Planet next, which is your environmental and social responsibility on the broadest scale. So environment could be the greater the, the world or the environment could be the neighborhood where your location is, the people, you know, the, the, the physical environment just there. And then finally, property. Property can matter, especially if it's others' property, has your organization infringed on others' property in some way, uh, caused people to lose money over something, for example. Then that's important too. But those are three good Categories to think about for you to analyze. I would encourage conversation and, and reflection before responding. You need an absolute policy to not only your employees, but frankly, your board members too, that no one speaks on behalf of the organization without some consultation first. Sometimes even well-meaning board members will speak off their personal opinion, um, and that may not benefit the organization. So go back to that spokesperson policy that we spoke about earlier. And finally, look at conversations in context. What looks very critical to you may be the way conversations are conducted on a given platform. So step back, look at how people normally speak there, look at what tends to happen. Do your best to project forward on how the trajectory seems to be going. And then should the organization be responsible for something that could have hurt people, planet, or property? Speak. Speak in short sentences. Speak with sincerity. The more offensive, the higher you go with the spokesperson. Keep monitoring and, and respond appropriately. Excellent. And there's no such thing as off the record. <laughs> there is I think that's a, that's a key point as well. You know, very often we talk to reporters or just could be social media influences and we think everything is off the record when there's an issue and crisis there's no such thing as off the record and i think to jackie a little bit uh, i think singapore pools how do you deal with negative comments on social media would you like to it, weigh in on that i think it goes back to uh, some of the points that kathy talked about earlier right um and we need to decide beforehand how we want to deal with some of these comments if you operate in a uh, somewhat controversial space, then you have to yeah. accept that there will be negative comments and you have to take it in your stride and you have to decide, are these negative comments worth responding to? 
or are they just trying to um, make noise because they're frustrated with some other issues and you are you just happen to be the the uh, boy for them to to bid up right um, but I think we need to consider a few factors as well are the comments factual if they're not factual we have to respond immediately will they impact our reputation what they are saying um, again we want to think about whether we want to put out a, a statement on our platform to counter some of these issues if it affects our reputation if it's very uh, uh, negative or if it's just a, a ranting comment, you might well just want to take him offline and respond to him privately to address some of his concerns, if they make sense. And again, not every negative comment needs responding to. So we need to be um, have a policy in place and uh, have that uh, thinking process in place before we act on it. Thank you, Jackie. And on that same note, actually, we move. We can move on to the third topic, which is basically how the, how would you advise a non-profit to establish an effective crisis communications management plan. I don't know if Ani, would you like to weigh in on that? Crisis communication management plan. Yes. <laughs> um, because, um, I mean, how do I say? Every day, it could be a crisis. You have to, as a communication person, you wake up to that possibility because you, know, you never know when somebody would pass a comment, like Jackie said, like Kathy said, things about people, property, and all these things always happening. So um, before I talk about the crisis communication management plan, I just want to add one thing that when you have a negative comment, you must remember not to fall into the trap of a war of words. Because if somebody says that, fix your bone, well, please don't be too hasty to respond to that. Sometimes this unnecessary noise just you know, dies out. So you have to sometimes bid your time and see, manage the reputation. And even for reputational uh, risk, what you have to weigh in, what is the risk of responding to it and creating more questioning rather than not responding to it and letting it die. So these, these are the two scenarios you have to manage, uh, especially uh, for crisis communication management plan, a communication uh, person should have a very prominent seat on the table for sure because uh, messaging is everything. How you convey anything about a crisis is important. A slight tweak here and there could change the meaning or could deflect from what the actual messaging is about. And uh, in my experience, I have shared some um, minor to major crises. Uh, it always boils down to how well your communication call tree is before the crisis actually happens. So if you have done a crisis communication drill, you are very good already. Yes, it will not go as you drilled uh, in the real scenario, but you would have some experience and that would prepare you for how to react. Uh, and then once you have the communication plan ready in that, whose role is what, you have your spokesperson ready uh, who will speak and backups as well, because you never know whether the spokesperson, what if it happens at uh, Sunday midnight and your CEO is not answering the phone? Will you stay quiet? No, right? So if it is an urgent situation where you have to respond, then you have to have a pre-approved plan, what can be said, what cannot be said. Or there was one point that Kathy mentioned uh, previously is about, I will get back to you. That is not a bad response. That shows that you care, that shows that you are actually making sure that you have the right information and you will convey it once you gather it. That shows a very good uh, way of uh, addressing things. Uh, so don't, thank you, don't, Ani. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 it's fine. Then. I mean, I was right, just right. Uh, concluding by but saying that those good, are the few main things. Yeah. Okay. yeah, particularly during an issues and crisis, don't try to spin your way through or bluff your way through. I think that's very, very critical. Uh, I uh, Maybe Kenny can weigh in a little bit on this. And if you have any life examples to share based on your own experience, I think that would be very interesting as well. Follow Annie's advice on the declining comment uh, policy and give your people a bit of language. Often in crisis communications training, we go through a drill where we give people an entire scenario. This has happened, that, 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 that. Now the reporter is calling and the person, the journalist who's calling will ask all sorts of questions about it. And the only thing this organization rep uh, representative is supposed to do in this round is to decline politely, show respect for the media, but decline because 
most of your employees and even board members will be in that category that when they get that first call, they need to very politely say, thank you so much for your interest. Let me take your details. We will get back to you with a statement. But the journalist will will play them out, right? Well, in your personal opinion, what do you think it could be? If it's this, then will the person be fired or not? And it's so tempting to start answering because the, the human inclination is to respond. So give them that language and teach them that it's okay to keep saying patiently, much appreciate, I'll put your question down, we will get back to you. And that's it. Um, two other quickies I would say, be very aware that board members often think it's okay to argue with a journalist or pick up the phone to a journalist, especially if they themselves have been mentioned at all in the article. Again, you need to reinforce to them very strongly, please don't speak on behalf of the organization. Have a primary liaison or, or a task force or committee of some sort to have it run through. Just take those few extra minutes to consider a response. Um, someone asked a question on the chat uh, about ways to respond, for example, to anonymous feedback or how to determine whether to respond or not. One tip I would give is take a look at what people in the hospitality sector do. That's a sector that has really professionalized responding to every comment with uh, thank you and we always aspire to high standards and uh, a bit of other, frankly, often templated language, but very respectful. So if you go on TripAdvisor or anywhere like that, every time there's a review, in any of the major hotel brands or restaurant chains, there will be a comment. So take a look at how they do that and come up with your version of that. Great answer. I personally have had experience where an ex-colleague revealed too much to a, a journalist while taking the elevator in the hotel from the 10th floor to the lobby. He just met the, the person that lived and they started chatting. And after that, I got bombarded with questions. So again, you know, don't speak too much. <laughs> To casual people, yeah, that you meet in the lift. I think uh, uh, Candice, I think you also mentioned, uh, Candice, you mentioned before that there's nothing like off the record. And exactly. having been a journalist before, I know you're right. Because, <laughs> you know, however, you cannot be friendly with a journalist, even if it's your spouse, because nothing is off the record <laughs> for them. You know? <laughs> exactly. You can be friendly. You just don't have to, you just can't reveal too much. <laughs> I think if I, I can just... Uh, want to. Sorry, yes, Jackie. Sorry, just yeah. a quick one to add on to the crisis comps that Ani was talking about. I think yes. uh, beyond, beyond crafting the initial answering statement, if your yeah. organization has certain scenarios that you know are very likely to happen to you, you would also want to draft statements in preparation so that you leave the, the uh, details blank that you can fill in straight away, but you are able to issue a statement quickly to respond to a crisis. And because the last thing you want to do is to leave the uh, reporter hanging and write their own stories if they have other uh, spokes, uh, other interviewees that provided that information, right? And um, it happened to me um, 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 once. This uh, issue brewed at 4 p.m. Uh, on a Friday evening when my CEO, the official spokesperson, was on a plane on a 10-hour flight. Uh, <laughs> and... Um, and of course, the, the reporter can't wait because they have uh, people on record saying certain things about the organization, right? Um, we go, we call a meeting, we have our legal counsel who says, don't respond, you don't need to respond. And I'm like, if I don't respond now, the reporter is going to write his own story without our statement, and that's even worse. So, um, so always have a, a draft statement uh, prepared and always be prepared to go out and make a statement rather than leave the narrative uh, uh, to be imagined by, by the reporter or the, or the readers. That's so true. I mean, the objective, one of the objectives of a crisis communications plan is so that you are prepared. <laughs> it's all about being prepared. So you'd be able to, who are the key, who's in the team, who should speak, who should not speak, what are the next steps? You know, no, so and this, but you know, plan. Yeah. that never really works out. I mean, I agree with everything, but I know that However many templated responses you have, each time you have to go through it all over again. And that's not a bad thing because you see that like, you know, you build immunity over time. This is what you do. This is a crisis immunity. And uh, what you're doing every time you face the crisis, every time you address it, you learn some lessons 
and you do some successes and you take the successes with you in your stride but the lessons you keep at the back of your mind and see apply next time but it is absolutely essential to have a template even if you don't use it whole soul because yep. mentally you feel stronger yep exactly so as you think to yourselves perhaps well, what would my template be what would go into it some areas you might think about are you should already have a code of conduct so should there be accusations of any behavior in the organization uh, that might be considered inappropriate, you'd be referencing your code of conduct. Uh, you probably have safety policies or safety procedures, maybe certain procedures that are always followed before certain events, et cetera. Then again, you want your whole team to know that if there's anything that suggests a safety violation that they reference back to that source. You have many existing uh, policies, procedures, guidelines, approaches within the organization, HR policies, for example, that you will need to reference depending on the topic. So even if you are just doing an alignment that says these sorts of topics, we make sure that we reference back to these existing documents that will help you in the moment. Yeah. And so just to add one more thing. Yeah. yeah, just so, one, one more thing is that sometimes negative comments would lead to uh, answers that may not be very, how to say, positive. You may have to accept that there's something wrong was done. And even in that case, you can be humble, uh, honest, but you don't have to elaborate too much. Just thank them for uh, bringing that to your attention and then move and say that what needs to be done, we will do and we will address this, but move on from there. I think um, we should start addressing the questions in the chat, you know, uh, because uh, we do have limited time. So I'm just going to run through the list uh, according to the, you know, when they were asked. So the first question is, what, what are the key points when we set up a C-19 task force in the organization? I'm actually not sure what C-19 is. I'm, I don't know if anybody has an answer to that. or COVID. You're talking about the COVID-19 task force? Ah, okay. Okay. I think. All right. Uh, Jackie, do you want to take that? COVID-19. Okay, I was like, C-19. I, uh, any... I think the communications part is only one small aspect of the whole uh, COVID task force. Right. But you definitely yep. need to be part of that task force so that you get uh, information and you know exactly what the situations are and then you can craft your uh, statements accordingly. And I think by now... If you don't have um, some of these draft statements or responses already worked out, then um, you, you should get onto it because we are already uh, very deep into the pandemic and the cases are exploding every day. And sooner or later, one of one member or another of your organization is going to be impacted. Is that going, how are you going to contain that? Um, your communications part, you probably need to start issuing statements based on the protocols that the task force has worked out. And you need to be part of that task force so you get uh, uh, information fast. And then you can release a statement okay. or answer queries on social media. Mm -hmm. I guess so I better I add say, something here yeah. because, I mean, Duke NUS Medical School has been at the forefront of combating COVID-19. <laughs> I mean, our professor Eng Yong has been Singaporean of the year and, you know, doing so much of work for all our professor and emerging infectious diseases program against COVID-19. I mean, so that, that, that actually is a very valid point, Jackie, that, you know, in the COVID-19 task force, what is important is that internally, you know that you're abiding by all the regulations. You know what you need to do when something happens. You know how to communicate to uh, internal audiences as well as the relevant external audiences. Definitely communication, your communication leader should have a uh, key role, key, pay, key stay in the, stay, uh, you know, the, on the table there. And uh, the idea is to understand the procedural form, the communication forms, and whatever related uh, things that out, outputs are required and whether you have pre-settled that. COVID-19 is different from, uh, how to say, other crises because here you know what will be the desired outcome for each action that happens. So, for example, if somebody turns out to be COVID-19 positive, what does the organization need to do? Yes, you need to do inform everybody else. You have the certain number of days that you need to do a work from home implementation, then you need to do cleansing. So you know what the outcomes are gonna happen. So you just make sure that you have the planning done for that and the messaging for that. This one, you can do the templating at any is fine. Great. 
Next question, uh, I'll move on to the next question. Is there a distinct difference between communications for corporates and non-profit? Anyone who would like to take that? Sure, why not? Because I, I think there's not much different, different that way because mm -hmm. communication principles are same. So if you see all of us here, at least, uh, I mean, Candice, Jackie and I, we have worked in different sectors. So it's not like we are communicationally uh, communicate, uh, communicating only in particular sector. Once you know the principles of communication, you can apply that anywhere. And, you know, so Jackie, you want to add something? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, I think the only difference when it comes to, to corporates versus nonprofit or any other organizations is your stakeholders might be different. So you, mm. for, organ for charities, you probably also need to take into consideration your donors and your board of trustees. But I think beyond that, principles are the same. Uh, some of the elements that we talked about, some of the things that you need to consider when you communicate, those apply to whether you're charity or, or corporate. Yeah. And, and also, you know, when you're communicating, even for within a corporate, whether you're looking at your corporate reputation or your, your brand reputation, your audience may be different and your approach may be different, but I do agree the principles are more or less the same. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next question may perhaps for Kerry, can the panel share their thoughts, process, experience on communications in crisis management? And in such instances, is the organizational spokesperson sufficient? Or should senior leadership, even at the board level, be involved? Yeah. Well, we've already talked quite a lot about the crisis comms process, et cetera. So perhaps yeah. I'll go to the second half. The second part of the question, yeah. Um, senior leadership is important, and, and board members might be excellent spokespersons for you. Think about congruence. What you're looking for, which, by the way, is the same in a corporate too, is does this chosen spokesperson convey the qualities we're looking for at an organizational level and also on the issue at hand? So if, for example, yours is a charity that uh, cares for stray dogs, then you want someone who uh, personifies dog lovers, someone who, who you know, is genuinely um, there on the ground, you know, who, who can really convey that sincerity. Um, if, if your organization has a lot of board members who are very senior corporate people, but not necessarily helping in giving out the food in your food bank, they, they may have a limited role as spokespeople. And you may instead, again, want the people who are in the front lines. So just think about appropriateness. What represents our brand? Who should that person be? And if I can add there, sometimes, and Kathy, I don't know whether you agree with me or not, hopefully you will, uh, that sometimes if it is a very negative message that you're conveying, I prefer not to associate my senior leadership with that messaging. Uh, mm -hmm. If it is a written message, it's easy because you can attribute to, your, to a official spokesperson said this, 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 uh, mm -hmm. and not put any name association with that messaging. Uh, but mm -hmm. if you can't avoid it, then you could also use maybe the communication leader instead of the organization leader could pass the message uh, just so that you don't have neg negative associations with the leadership. Yes, yeah, 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 absolutely, Ani. I do agree. You've just got to play out the possible perceptions. So similarly, if your organization has uh, hopefully a mix of males and females on the board, but an issue comes up that is particularly gender sensitive involving women, then use a female board member as the spokesperson. That's been done uh, by corporates for, for, for a decade now. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's a very good point. <laughs> uh, moving on, uh, I, I think the next question, we've kind of addressed it. You know, how do you do different approach from the, for different segments? I mean, we've basically said that, you know, the same principles apply, but you just have to be clear on who your stakeholders are and customize according to your stakeholders. Uh, next question, what other platforms can charities use other than social media to build awareness? Anyone wants to take that, Katie? Plenty. So look at what the Children's Cancer Foundation does um, with Hair for Hope, how they use their own website really powerfully, how they get famous people, ministers, media corp stars, etc., to also join the cause. That 
of course, has social media elements to it, but it's not only social media itself. It's the prominence of the individuals. It's the website, as I say, their ability to do one-on-one -on -one communications. Uh, there are many other ways beyond social media, mainstream media too. So if, if a senior minister is getting shaved for hair for hope, that'll probably make a mainstream media story too. Yeah, and you can have events, you can have workshops like what we're doing now, panel discussions to raise awareness as well. So there's plenty of tools out there. Yeah. Um, sure anybody else wants to add to that? Probably the charities that Jackie supports have many other ways of engaging. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, okay. I think it goes back to the question of uh, who you want to reach, right? So you know where yep. they are. And where the touch points. Correct, exactly. So once you're clear of your objective, you know who your audience is, then you can plan whether it's an event or, or even an interview, put it on right. your own blog, for example, and so on and so forth. Back to what Ani said about touch points, you know, understanding your customers, mapping out their journey, figure out their touch points, and map their attention at their touch points. I mean, social media, um, everybody question. talks about because it's easy. You know, you, if you have a one-person team, you can manage multiple platforms. You can have, you know, forum blogs and, you know, all the things. But if you want to take it offline, then, you know, you need money, you need uh, teams, you need resources, time and everything. So uh, that really depends on how, how much you have as available. And if you... Um, Yes, sometimes you can manage things without uh, resources as well. When you talk to neighborhoods and maybe you just go by yourself and talk to people. Yes, depend. You know, you have to know what your purpose is, what you want to achieve. And accordingly, you can find multiple platforms. Uh, one more things, thing is uh, that sometimes, you know, you know, it helps to talk to people. Maybe you don't know what you want to do and what you can do. But like you have asked the question in this panel. Maybe what you could do is you could ask questions to your stakeholders and say, what else can we do collectively to bring our messaging out? And you'll be surprised at some uh, very different answers that can come out. The other consideration perhaps to think about is to leverage partners in the community. Mm. Um, Singapore Pools, for example, we work with many different uh, social service agencies and we tap on leverage on each other, even with the ministry, even with uh, other non-profit organizations to amplify some of the things that we want to do, uh, talk about their courses, partner people with other resources that we can tap on so we can help to support or sponsor some events, for example, and then we can amplify the cost. So it's not a one-off, but then you can um, um, spread the message further from there. That's definitely a very good strategy working with partners, partner collaborations. Um, I think we covered the ask. Uh, there's a question about sports association. You know, uh, how different do you think sports associations are in compar comparison to other non-profit, especially when there's another layer above you on the OB markers in media policies? I don't know if anyone of you has experience working with sports organizations. Not really, but yeah, Kathy, you wanted to say something. Well, we, we have done uh, spokesperson training for sports organizations, training, for example, football coaches who do com community work to, um, you know, enhance community engagement. And uh, uh, football or soccer coaches uh, may not necessarily come from a day-to-day -day job where they know how to be a spokesperson. That's a good example, similar to say your campaign spokesperson, where we've just trained them to simply speak about their passion in a, a quite limited way. And, and in those cases, they may not even necessarily be speaking to media. There might be little clips that you put into some sort of uh, content you create yourself to put on your website or, or circulate, put into a video. Um, but that's been highly effective because sports are about a passion. And people want to speak to the ones who have have that in their belly and in their heart. I think I think the the the, the next question on sports actually relates back to the question we had earlier on arts because sports and arts tend to be if they are charities they tend to be regarded as uh, uh, lower on the rank of neediness. So it's harder for them to raise funds. But I think Jackie actually answered the question earlier on, you know, how you, you can actually link it back, like art therapy for mental wellness, likewise sports for health and, and, and mental physical wellness as well. So I think uh, we basically covered that question earlier. Uh, the question is, uh, because sports organizations are charities and how do you change the mindset when they consider them, when they always consider 
what's in it for me? When donors or sponsors always consider what's in it for me, even when they are dealing with a charity. How about a national award later on at Olympics? <laughs> you saw the frenzy <laughs> of, uh, you know, our sports people. Every time they were, at, I mean, uh, participating in anything, I could see the social buzz was so excited about that. I think we can, we can, we can create some messaging around that, that when you support this sports charity, what, what are the possible outcomes? You are giving an opportunity to people who may not have this opportunity without this event or without this purpose. I think it's a powerful message. And then, Ani, what about uh, alumni? So just as the Duke NUS school looks to its, to its former, to its graduates to say, look at the wonderful opportunity you got, come back and support us. Uh, surely any sports organization would want to do the same with those who've gone through the program. If, if I got a chance through sports to do something I might not otherwise have done, once I move on and make a decent living, of course, I'm an obvious person to come to for support. No, absolutely right. And probably it doesn't even have to be a person who benefited from sports charity uh, through the same organization. It could be some other organization. But it's just the messaging that when I was young, I didn't have money. And then I wanted to play sport. But this person, this organization helped me. Just that message could be so powerful. And it goes back to, you know, you don't need a wide audience you go to the audience that's passionate about sports. And if everyone that's passionate about sports support you, I think that's a wide enough pool potentially. Yeah, because it's going to, hard, it's going to be very hard to kind of, you know, preach to those who are not, you know, interested in sports. No, so I was it's working the same for the arts as well. It's the same for the arts as well, yeah. I, I, I saw this news somewhere on one of the TV channels about how uh, this person built a charity around wheelchairs because he is a wheelchair bound person. He's interested in sports and whatever wheelchair he had was not working out for him to play sports. So he built by himself and then he created a community around that and a charity which now supports people who want to play sports on the wheelchair. And I thought that was such a wonderful, uh, so powerful story. I really love that. And so yeah, if that person a, can do it. Yeah. example. Perfect example of what we are trying to drive at. Um, the next question, I think everyone probably has a viewpoint. What are the considerations uh, for engaging a PR company? Uh, I, I'm not sure if, uh, I think Singapore Pools, do, uh, if you engage and Caddy comes from a PR agency. So happy to hear all three of you give quick comments because we are I mean, running out of time and we have yeah. 15 more questions. <laughs> so I yeah, can quick very quickly quick tell one. you that if you what think are, what, that are, what do you look for? If you think that hiring a PR agency will solve all your problems, no, they won't. Because when it comes to writing a message, they will come and seek your guidance. Say, how do you want us to? They can recommend some things. They can help you ease the burden of doing the task. But you will work, have to work equally hard, close with them, closely with them to define what you want to achieve. So it's, 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 if you want to build capacity, increase the capacity of team, yes. But if you think that all your problems can be solved by the PR agency, I, my answer is, I don't think that happens in the real life. Okay, Jackie? That is true. I think um, uh, when you engage a PR company, you also have to think about what exactly is it that you want out of them. They can definitely help you refine your messages. They can help you to uh, tell your story and find you the, uh, the, the suitable platforms. They can help you to train your media spokespersons but they can't tell you who you are and what you want to do, right? So once you get that clear, you can go out to look for agencies. And if you're a Singapore-based profit, you probably don't need a big, huge, huge PR agency because you don't need the global touch points. So you might just want to look for a, a boutique PR or a PR consultant if you have very specific needs about what you want to achieve. Um, but back to Ani's point, you need to know what, what is it that you want first and be clear before you go there. I mean, just want to add that, I mean, there are, I have used PR agencies all the time, but like Jackie said, for specific things. So I know that I want to do this project and this is a specialized agency, they will help me yet because I know what I want, then it's easier. Okay, thank you. Um, Kerry, coming from a PR agency, do you want to weigh in on that? Uh, my friends have said so much so well. Uh, maybe one final thought would be, be realistic before you start and think about what's in it for the agency. 
there has to be something in it for them. Do they need to build more of a reputation because they're new or small or young? Um, are they uh, looking to fulfill certain compliance requirements within the organization? Are they looking to put junior people on so that they can learn while helping you? All of which are very legitimate what's in it for me is for them. But, but be honest with yourself about what they're getting out of it too, uh, because right. there are also commercial organizations that have to hit their own bottom line and, and you're a piece of that. You'll be using resource, so why? Why do they want to let you use their resource that won't make them any money? Be open right. about what's in it for them. Thank you. Okay, let me just look at the questions to see what else we have. Uh, what's the best way to respond to anonymous feedback on social media accounts which tarnish the, tarnish the reputation of your organization? Does it depend on whether such feedback gain traction? We kind of addressed that earlier, but if anybody wants to weigh in a little bit more, no. Look at the okay, hospitality. Okay, we have. Sorry, yes, Kelly? My point about the hospitality industry earlier. Yeah. 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 Okay. Look at how they handle it with grace. What do we do if we have a boss or bosses who are really terrible at public comms but insist on handling it themselves? I'm not sure if this is a comms problem, but um, oh, no, it does could anyone actually want be, to address it? It could be solved easily by saying, yes, please go ahead, but tell them what the repercussions could be and help them convey the message by giving them some talking points or something and spokesperson training perhaps. Yep, I think it, it's a, that's a good idea. If your boss is bad at communicating, give him some training. Yeah, but my advice is this: use. Sorry, your, my advice is pick up your phone, ask your boss a few of those questions that you know the media will. Film your boss, make it open. I'm going to film you so that you can see yourself how you're coming across. Most people will realize what they need to work on as they watch the replay. Yep. It's, it's always good to do like a mock interview, like a rehearsal, you know, pretend, get bring someone in, pretend to be a journalist, ask him some questions, see how he answers, film him, show it back to him, like what uh, Kenny says. Too, yeah. It's essential, really, Candice, it's essential. And you don't even have to get an official trainer or an official journalist. No. I've right. given questions to my children before and said, just... Hold it up and ask me the questions. The practice you need is opening your mouth and saying it. And your boss needs also to open his or her mouth and realize that it's a lot harder to say than it is to just read the words on the screen. Reading the words on the screen is not preparation. So you've got to practice by opening your mouth. You've got to record it. If not visually, at least record the sound and listen back. And if you're the person responsible for the key messages, You've also got to do that full analysis back to what we were saying about sports a moment ago, just as sports coaches watch the video of the match they lost yesterday to see what can we learn from that. You've got to do the same thing with uh, recordings or, or with any media coverage that you do get and just map it back to your key messages. How are we tracking? Are we delivering what we intended? Yeah, and it's not about just delivering the messages. It's about delivering authenticity as well. So your behavior, by watching yourself, you will be able to tell whether you come across as a convincing spokesperson, you know, or you're a nervous spokesperson, like something to hide, and that's dangerous. So it's very important to have a rehearsal, not just so that he knows the messages, but how he presents himself as well. And if All by right. chance, if, if you are playing back something, Candice, and you yeah. know that that yeah, you don't even have to tell him. <laughs> yeah. But but what but what if you play it for the boss and the boss says, yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> then you may have to do that extra analysis of pulling out the words a journalist would pull out. What if the right. journalist only put only took these 10 words here together? Well, but I explained the whole context. Well, yeah, but the journalist isn't going to use everything you said. So now we really need to look carefully at that word choice and ask, is that what you want quoted? Because once you've spoken, you don't have any control of which piece of it they use. Yep. Yeah. Always good to have strong sound bites as well. Okay. Next question. Uh, I think it relates back to one of the answers earlier. When a board member is quoted and implicated, would it not be fair for her to be him or her to be involved? The input sought, otherwise it would seem avoiding the issue. Ani, do you want to take that? 
Yeah, so, um, well, I agree actually that, you know, that you have to work together. It depends on what the context is. If the context is uh, you want to clarify and you have solid uh, messaging to give on that, yes, definitely. But if, for example, you don't have anything worthwhile to add to that response, then I would suggest yeah. that perhaps no need to entertain that or don't get into the, like I said before, war of words. Yeah, I think the uh, while well, you don't want to appear to be defensive or be hiding an issue and hence you're not speaking up, but you also want to be cognizant that if you're involved, you might get defensive or emotional when you are asked to answer a question on the spot. And that might make it worse. So if you are not sure that your spokesperson involved can handle the emotions, then perhaps don't put him on the spot. Don't let him speak to a uh, reporter live and just issue a statement on his behalf, for example. So everything is situational in that sense, right? It depends on the issue. It depends on the crisis. It depends on the situation. So, so as, as Ani said earlier, the template is only there to guide you. It's not the, you know, the, the exact thing that you need to do when a crisis occurs. Okay, uh, next question. Can you advise on how to engage with the media for professional body? Oh, I have uh, one good uh, uh, example for that, which is that, mm -hmm. I mean, not example, like some suggestion, which is professional body means your professionals, a group of professionals who have subject matter expertise. And that is so attractive to media. So use that as a catalog, for example, list down the experts, list down their capabilities and subject matter expertise, and tell media that these experts are available for commenting on any stories which are related to these uh, subject matters, and media would love them. And if you are trying to micromanage it, then it may not work. But if you give a little bit of you know, free push there, uh, for some industries it may work, some industries it may not work. So for example, our school, Duke NUS has amazing amount of expertise in different diseases, conditions, uh, and different treatments that we are advising and uh, researching on. So we have our researchers available to all media and they have direct contact. So internally, we also have like this uh, kind of, um, how to say, gentlemen or gentle ladies code of conduct that every time some of the experts is uh, reached out by the media, they inform us. So at least we can monitor it and highlight it as much as we can. Thank you. Um, I think we probably have time for maybe two or three more questions. Um, can you give me some advice on how my organization can change its brand image? We are a secular organization that aids seniors regardless of race, language or religion, but most people tend to associate us with being a racially based organization. What is your advice uh, to help us move away from this impression? So basically, uh, their organization already has, a, so people already have a certain fixed perception about their organization and they want to influence that perception based. Maybe use a, or a change that perception. Maybe yeah. use a community influencer who is of a different race to convey the messaging, maybe. Okay. Jackie, you got anything to add to that? Uh, well, for example, about, Singapore pools, a lot of people associate with gambling, right? So yeah. how, how do you influence or change perception? That could be quite relevant as well. Yeah. I have to first say that um, brand image is not yeah. something that you can change overnight, right? There's already a Definitely. fixed perception yes. of your organization. And especially if you talk about, uh, if most people already have a certain association with your organization, you are going to have to slowly build a consistent message over time and repeat it over and over again. Uh, to get that message set, set in. But first you still have to start with the, what is your end point? What is it that you don't like about the current brand perception? And what is it that you want to change to? And if the current perception is so and so, why is that so? What, what are you projecting? Are you always putting out stories uh, using beneficiaries of a certain race, for example? Or is your spokesperson always talking about a, a, a certain race that they are helping? And is that how the image is built over time? And if so, then if you are aware that the messages are, are helping to build that uh, wrong perception, then try to change that message and put out different images that you want the, the, uh, your viewers to move towards to. 
but it's not going to be changed overnight. I think that's a key point. Yeah, changing perceptions, it's a long process. Thank you. Uh, next question, what's your take on social media policy for staff volunteer board on their personal social media accounts? Important. <laughs> yeah. Very important. I think you have to start yeah. with um, um, realizing that everybody is going to say anything they want on their own personal accounts, but it's going to be it's going to reflect on the organization. I think if you think back of a high profile incident where uh, uh, assistant director talked about Malay weddings at Voidex, the the speed at which the repercussions reached the organization was astounding. Right, so you need to learn that lesson. So you put out guidelines about what kind of content they can and cannot do. And it has to align very well with your employee's code of conduct anyway. So if you don't expect your employee to go out and talk about um, uh, racism, for example, then they shouldn't do that on social media. It's the same. Your code of conduct for the employees should apply to social media as well. And it should also go down to, um, um, if you want to talk about the organization, what are the things that you can talk about and what are the subjects that you shouldn't? Because at the end of the day, they are going to identify you as part of uh, uh, the organization as well. Thank you, Jackie. No, I absolutely ah, I agree see. that you know uh, you have to you have to define what you want them to say, uh, and I I mean I really believe that it's important sometimes for people to know that they are not official spokesperson, and when they achieve something and when they read something that they want to respond to, they must either either specify that this is in their personal capacity or bring that message to the communication people so that they can help them address that. Great. I, I think we'll just uh, end with two quick questions. Um, in the social service, how do you get a comms branding buying at a program level for social workers? Because things like this are probably the lowest priority in their work. I'm not sure. I'm quite sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Get, uh, maybe we move on to the next question because uh, it's not. Do you have tips on how we can build or strengthen relationships with mainstream media? We can probably end with that. Yeah. Kelly, do you want to take that? Yeah. It gets tougher and tougher all the time because their jobs have gotten harder and harder. There are fewer of them. They have less resource. Um, one tip is watch what they're writing, observe their uh, journalism and find ways to connect with the themes that they are showing interest in or to even refer back. I've really enjoyed your series on X and what I'm suggesting builds on that. Or, or even if it's just to build rapport when you meet them to say, oh, actually I've been watching the articles you've been writing on health lately. Um, Ani, uh, Jackie, you have ongoing relationships with media, I know, and, and your teams are doing it too. So you can probably speak more to what behaviors do and don't work nowadays. But most of all, I would say just be very aware of them and, and pay them the respect they deserve. No, I absolutely agree because, uh, yes, you can have arranged coffee. I mean, pre-COVID, we had coffee sessions with media. <laughs> who write about us and you know who we want to engage. But it's not about that. You really want to build a relationship and the relationship built on a transactional uh, sort of attitude doesn't really work. So if you're genuinely interested, just reach out. And I, I mean, our Singapore media, we are so privileged. They are really open, flexible, and they listen to you. They, they convey your stories. One other way I, I find very useful is to showcase what you bring to them. You know, that way you have subject matter expertise in your area. Your organization is purposeful. You can take that. And that is a great media strategy to think about how you can establish thought leadership in your industry, in your sector, and write commentaries or opinion pieces based on facts and things that you want to change in the community. You bring that to the newspaper and they, they would love it. They love these kind of opinion pieces. I think to add on to that, I Thank think um, first of all is to have an understanding and keep an open and honest relationship. Uh, understand that they are also trying to do their job. So have that mutual respect and don't think that they have to tell your story regardless of what. Or So when they call and ask you a question that you don't like to answer, um, don't put them off. And uh, over time, you build that, that trusting relationship that they can come to you first 
uh, even if you if you can't answer them, they will understand because you have been truthful um, all this time. Being truthful doesn't mean that you share everything that you're not supposed to. Being truthful means that uh, you answer them to a certain extent and not uh, have them think about, uh, are you avoiding me? Can I reach you in an emergency? And uh, also sometimes like, um, I think like Ani implied, it does help to also uh, reach out to them uh, regularly and share with them some of the things that uh, perhaps give them some ideas about what other stories they can, they can do. And uh, if they need quotes, even if it's not directly related to your organization or what you do, you might just want to help them out or, or suggest some other people that could help out with their story. And that's appreciated. And over time, that's how you build a, a trusting relationship. Yeah. And Definitely, sorry, just to add very quickly that board members can do that amazingly because they are on the board of the charity, but they come from different sectors. So their particular sector, if they can... Uh, remark on that, provide quotation, but also use the designation from the board of the charity that you have hit two birds with one stone. Yeah, I think when it comes to engaging the media, when you're trying to engage the media, I guess it's about finding the sweet spot as well. You know, what the media is interested in and what you have to, you know, um, share with them as well. And then, you know, that's a win-win for everybody. Oh, we're out of time, but just to wrap up, I would like to invite uh, each speaker to maybe just give one final piece of advice from profit participants here, and then we can wrap up and hand it back to John Wei. Uh, let's start alphabetical again. <laughs> Sorry, with Katie. If you can just one advice, <laughs> 20 seconds <laughs> per person. Boil it down to a very short message and give it to every member of the organization. Thank you. Uh, Ani? Well, I would say to the board members specifically that if you have hired a communication professional, empower them. Don't micromanage them. Let them do the job so that they can help you build the brand that you want. Finally, Jackie. Be very clear about what you stand for. Uh, build that message around it. Be consistent, be consistent, be consistent. Thank you very much, speakers. I hope um, everyone has enjoyed today's session. I certainly have. And I would like to now hand it back to Dr. May. Well, um, thank you, Candice, uh, Kathy, Annie, and Jackie. Um, I Perhaps I would like to take that one question uh, uh, regarding the program people. Uh, how do you get... Um, the program people to be involved in, in your messaging. Um, so just a quick example. I remember joining the Salvation Army back in 2001. Uh, and one of the first things that I did was to go down to the centers and to interview the people on the ground. Um, I remember talking to uh, the counselors, the care workers in the uh, other care center. And one thing that really um, left a, a deep impression on my on me is when I went to interview uh, one of the kids in the uh, in the children's home, and this was quite a while ago. If you recall, um, it was out in the in the news at that time, so it's not uh, it's, it's open source. Uh, a young child, about four or five, was thrown down the rubbish chute by her mother, and she was found and brought to the uh, children's home. Uh, not only did I interview her, who was at the time maybe just eight years old by then, um, I needed to tell her story and I had to pluck up enough courage to go and listen to her. And at the same time, together with her was her caregiver. Um, and that, that really uh, drove home the point of why I was doing what I was doing, and that is uh, to be the PR and, and, and fundraising director for the Salvation Army. Um, the, the people on the ground are very busy. The, the clients are busy and there are a lot of confidentiality around what they do and we should never expose them uh, unless it's with full consent. And the, the caregivers and the, the ground people, the counsellors, they have so much on their plate, but yet they have, they have the best uh, branding message for the charity. Um, the only way to get them uh, on your side is to, be, is to be involved in what they do, to have a lot of empathy, um, and support for what they do. So when they feel that you care about what's happening on the ground, they are more likely to, to support you, set aside time in their busy schedule to share with you some of the things they're going through that would 
contribute to your brand message. Um, so perhaps that's why I, uh, one way of answering the question that we have on getting buy-in on, on the ground. Um, the, I want to appreciate uh, all our speakers for their very candid, um, very organic sharing. I realize that um, uh, it is uh, not very prescriptive, you know, and I appreciate that because I think on the ground, when you have to execute something, um, there is no prescription just to take a leave from what Ani said. You have what you have, but you have to adapt. And I think that is key. You know, where the rubber hits the road, what do you do? Having said that, I think um, I would like to offer IPRS uh, as, a, as a resource. If there's uh, any questions, any further uh, support, ideas that you need, um, please um, approach the MPL and they would uh, maybe funnel some of the questions and some of the, the needs that you have to IPRS and we'll do our best to follow up with uh, any further questions that you have. Um, the IPRS um, is there for the uh, practitioners like yourself, whether you are corporate comms, uh, PR comms, uh, marketing comms, uh, you're welcome to join us. Um, uh, um, members uh, do, do have uh, the support of the IPRS, both in terms of training, support um, and, and knowledge sharing. Uh, the requirements are on, on our website. Um, we do have training courses that you are uh, free to join, uh, to sign up for. Uh, our very popular and ongoing intro to PR course um, gives you the foundation. Uh, we also have other courses to target certain key uh, content, such as digital content and marketing. And the last uh, thing that I want to share with you, and a bit of sales and market sales as well, but really quite important is our PRISM Awards. Uh, which is our industry award. PRISM stands for Public Relations in Service of Mankind. And I think that is key to what we do as communicators. Why do we communicate? If not to be in the service of mankind, to make sure that what we say and what we do uh, builds our community, build our, our strength together as, as, as a unit, as a society. So feel free to, to submit your entries. If you hear of any good PR projects that has been completed in the last 24 months, celebrate them, uh, participate in our PRISM Awards. Um, all details are online and I look forward to seeing you another time and uh, um, another occasion, you know, together with CMPL or reach out to any of us through LinkedIn. Uh, we are there, uh, happy to connect with you. So I'll hand this time over to uh, Kitson. Thank you so much, uh, Jack May. Well, uh, we've come to the end of this whole Board Connect series for today. So on behalf of the team at the Centre for Nonprofit Leadership, uh, we really like to express our thanks and appreciation to Jack May and the team uh, from IPLS for working with us to organise uh, today's Board Connect Forum. Also, a very big thank you to Candice, Ani, Jackie and Katie for really the highly interactive panel discussion on this very important topic of public relations and uh, media policy. For myself, I've also learned a lot from this um, short but impactful uh, sharings. And I believe the rest of us as well. Well, so before I close off, uh, as usual, I'd like to invite all our charities to approach CMPL, as always, for all your board advisory matters. We are here to journey with you along, your, along the way. And we are also a shared services partner of the charities unit. So we are committed to be with you to drive organization excellence and governance at your belt level, right? Uh, we will also be bringing you more Bot Connect forums. And the next upcoming Bot Connect forum is actually on the 27th of October. It's conflict of interest and my board. I believe this will be another hot topic so please join us. Please uh, watch out for the EDM that goes out. I believe should be sometime this week or has really gone out. Do remember to sign up for this particular session on the 27th of October. As what Jeremy mentioned as well, uh, for all your good PR publicity, please do not forget to submit your entries for the Prism Awards. All right? Uh, non-profits, you are eligible as well. Correct, right, Jeremy? It's not only yes, for non-profits, for, for right? It's non-profits as well. Right? Tell us all the good work that you are doing. <laughs> yeah, so please submit your entries. Um, anything else, let us know. As the numbers of COVID begin to rise, well, fellow leaders, 
I wish you all the best. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay well until we can meet again. All right. So thank you so much and have a great lunch, early lunch. All right. Thank you, everyone.